right. Well, thank you all so much for coming, traveling, and making time in your busy weekend to come. It's a delight to be doing this again. So I was assigned the topic of the fear of man. And so if you put it in context, I think um, hopefully you'll see how the talks all sort of link together. So mom talked about the fear of God and how that's foundational for everything. Um, obviously, the fear of God is a godly fear. I'm talking about the fear of man, which is an ungodly fear, a negative thing. And then Rachel is giving us the positive courage and steadfastness. So mom's is the foundation, and I'm like, what not to do? And Rachel's going to tell us <laughs> what to do. <clears throat> so the fear of man, I think, is it's different than just to talk about fear, generally speaking. You know, like you could talk about fear and how that's a problem, and that would be, you know, discuss worry and anxiety and the kinds of things that keep you up at night, but this is a more specific kind of talk. So Proverbs 29, 25, I think is a great place to start. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And it's just a short little verse, and, and you know, you read it and think, right, fear of man, bad, trust in the Lord, good, and then you move on. But there's actually so much going on in this verse that I think is really intense, actually, and profound. And the more you think about it, the more interesting it gets. So, you know, Proverbs is big with the contrasts. You know, it's like it gives you one thing and then it compares it or contrasts it to something else. And then you have to kind of sit there and try to figure out how those two things click together. And so in this one, you have the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So you've obviously got fear versus trust in both half, halves of the verse. You have man versus God, so you're fearing man versus trusting God. And then you have the first half, it brings a snare, but the second half, you are safe, which means that actually that's quite interesting because safety lies in trusting God, and apparently the dangerous path um, the one that is not safety first is to be fearing man because that's what gets you into the trap. That's when you fall in the hole. That's when you can't get back out. You know, when you fall into a trap, that's kind of the end of the story for you, right? Um, <clears throat> and the fear of man is what gets you there, which is interesting because actually usually what prompts our fears is a desire to be safe, right? It's a desire to get away from the danger, to run the other way, to get as far into the safety zone as we can. And so it's really weird and counterintuitive that if you fear man, that is a dangerous place to be, which is really, I think, the, you know, the more you think about it, the more interesting that gets. So um, this is a particular subject that I think God gave all of us a placement test on how well do you do with this kind of thing over the last couple of years. And it's really weird because it was so global that I know all of us had very different experiences over the last two years, but I know we all had to deal with something, you know, in this regard. And um, it, I think it is a really funny sort of like a placement test. How do you do with the fear of man? And I think we could all <laughs> reflect on how well we did on that subject. So if you look back over the last two years and you think, what are the things that really got to you? You know, the things that really were hard or terrifying or scary or panic inducing. Um, what were your particular temptations in everything? And so I'm talking about being afraid, not like having to solve a problem, you know, because all of us had to decide what to do and troubleshoot the situation as it, you know, presented itself. But I'm talking about being afraid, like where you can feel it in your chest or it keeps you awake at night, it consumes your thoughts. Um, you feel that, like, that terror that you used to feel when you were a little kid, like if you're playing hide and seek in the dark and you're like in a closet and the adrenaline is just pumping, you know, waiting for somebody to find you. Um, that physical, visceral feeling of just being afraid. I think there were all kinds of people who were consumed by that over the last few years. It's that panic that chases you. So um, over the last couple years, what were the things that, that really got to you? And I think, like, were you really scared of the virus? Like, really scared that you might get sick, that it might, you know, 
take out your aging parents or it might you know affect your kids or what if we all get sick and what if it sweeps through and all that kind of thing and and if you had that sort of a fear I think that's the kind of thing that you need to confess to God if it was consuming you but that's like a general worry right that's just general anxiety it's the kind of thing that it, it might be you're scared of you know what will happen if my kids get their driver's license and then and then they die in a car wreck you know it's just general worry general anxiety and I think we could all have perhaps fallen into that kind of worry, that kind of fear, um, just with the virus itself, or uncertainty about the future, like what are we gonna do? Our business is apparently not essential, or you know, what are we gonna do? We can't get workers, or what are we gonna do? You know, that sort of thing. There was uncertainty, there was a lot of um, everything being displaced, but that kind of thing, if that was consuming you, if you were not able to sleep, if you were unable to rest in God, through all that, then yes, confess it. But again, that's a general kind of worry. That's a general kind of fear. But how scared were you of what people were going to think of you for what you believed about everything? That's what we're talking about. It's the fear of man. It's the, like, what are they gonna, what are they gonna think about me if I actually say what I believe about something? So there were all kinds of opportunities for that to be a thing as well, like lots of places for us to get caught up in just being real scared of other people, honestly, and what they're, gonna, what they're going to say or do. So were you scared of posting anything at all online because you know, your friends will find out what you believe and then, oh no, um, were you scared of being ostracized by your church? for what you believed? Were you scared of someone yelling at you in the grocery store or on the street? Um, were you scared of your neighbors turning you into the authorities? And those are all the kinds of fears that I think many of us probably had to face over the last couple of years. But those are the specific kinds of fears that I'm talking about. It's the fear of other people. It's the fear of the crowd, of the dynamic that's gonna have me be, you know, laughed at or yelled at or whatever. So if you had to face those kinds of fears over the last few years, then did those fears get the best of you or did you get the best of them? And that's what I mean about the placement test. It's sort of like God gave us all a pop quiz and said, here, how do you do when, when everybody thinks you're, you know, whatever, horrible for whatever reason. Um, and I do think as the placement test is kind of funny because all, all the NSA kids are the new freshmen are arriving in town and having to get sorted into their classes. So they all have to go into Dr. Herb's office and sing. And then he tells them whether they made it into choir or whether they're in vocal tech <laughs> or uh, they're going to take the Latin, you know, placement test. And did you make it into honors Latin or are you in peasant Latin as <laughs> it is affectionately called? But not officially, that's just <laughs> unofficially. So, you know, when you take the test and then you find out like, where are you in all of this? Is this something that you need some extra work? Do you need a little remedial work to get you up to speed or are you, you know, passing this sort of test? And I think that is, God gave all of us, I think. I would be pretty confident in saying God gave all of us a chance to run some self-assessment there. Like, how did we do when we had to face that kind of thing? So did the fear get the best of you or did you get the best of it? And I think the question is definitely not whether you felt the pressure of that or whether you recognized that sensation of like, oh no, this could get real bad real quick. Right? It's not like if you felt that, well, you failed. It's not that, it's the how did you do given the presence of that feeling, right? How did you perform under that pressure? So recognizing the feeling of, oh dear, here it comes, I have to brace for this now or whatever, that's not sin and that's not cowardice, that's just, you know, reading the situation. It's how you decide to act when that feeling is strong that determines whether or not it was sin or whether or not you were a coward, right? Those are, that's sort of the, the litmus test. G.K. Chesterton makes this distinction well, but on a totally different topic. He says, hope is the power of being cheerful in circumstances that we know to be desperate. 
which I think is really a fantastic quote, but hope is the power of being cheerful in circumstances that we know to be desperate. So it's not that hope is blindly assuming the best all the time, right? Or hope is wistfully wishing for things to get better than they are right now. Hope is where you look it straight in the eye and think this is real bad. And then you choose to be cheerful in the face of that. So it's not like an inability to, to see the situation. It's like how you react to the situation. And I think that fear is similar. Like it, there's nothing sinful about seeing what's coming and feeling that like, oh no, but then it's what do you do with it? Did you crumple or did you not? So it's feeling that tug inside, feeling that panic or recognizing that danger or feeling that lump in your chest and then being brave is when you decide to do the right thing anyways, right? Having that, that you know, whatever adrenaline or whatever it is ahead of time, that's not the sin. It's if you then buckle under the pressure. So let's say that you knew with absolute certainty, like you can read the future and you know that if you show up to your church next Sunday, there's going to be a brigade of little busy bodies with cameras and they're going to take your picture and they're going to put you on Facebook and they're going to put you in the newspaper and they're going to call the cops and complain and they're going to just say, look at this, you know, super spreader who doesn't care about the lives of everyone around them. Now, that's not a fun situation, right? And you don't have to pretend that that's a fun situation. But how does that then impact your behavior when that's coming at you? So do you give in to the fear of man and you stay home and say that you have a headache anyways, so probably you should not be at church? Or do you rationalize it away by saying it's not a sin to stay home from church and I'm totally going to watch the sermon online? Um, or do you do the right thing despite how horrible it may turn out to get? in a minute, right? So what you decide to do with it, how you decide to play the situation is where the cowardice comes in. So let's say you have to give a presentation at work or you have to negotiate an awkward family Thanksgiving dinner and you know that what you do with the pronouns is gonna really make a difference, <laughs> right? If you decide to to just kind of like slide through it and, and I'll just kind of like not ruffle feathers and I'll just refer to him as a she just to kind of keep everything, you know, mellow. That's where you have allowed the, the fear of the crowd to dictate your behavior and have you do something that you actually know to be wrong and you have comp compromised your conscience so as to not upset every everyone around you. So the fear of man is when you buckle on your own convictions because of what people will think or say or do about you. And to be honest, you might very publicly buckle. You know, you might like do it where everybody saw you do it, you cheesed it and everybody knows. Um, you retracted your use of the pronoun, you know, in a tearful apology to everyone. You know, maybe you publicly buckle, but it might just be between you and God, right? He's maybe the only one who sees that you have just decided to change your conviction for the sake of not rocking the boat. And he might be the only one that knows that you're prepared to buckle <laughs> should the need arise um, because you're scared of your fellow humans and what they will make of you if you do the right thing. So again, over the last two years, I think we all got a, a big chance to see how this kind of thing affects us. And it might have been a real face-to-face -face kind of like in the moment you had to like, oh no, there's a whole thing going on. Or it might have been just that like, the fear that it could happen. And so I think we can all probably look back and ask ourselves how well, how well do we do <laughs> with that kind of pressure? Like either the actual event happening or just the fear that it might happen in a minute. How did we do? And I think honestly ma masks are an obvious place to you know, think about this question, but it's also a super complicated topic, right? Because it's not a real cut and dry sort of like, did you, pray to bail, or did you not, right? The masks was, was far more complicated than that. Um, there were lots of differing takes because 
lots of people thought they were super helpful and some people thought they were not super helpful and and then you had the private businesses are they allowed to tell me too and what if it's a you know publicly traded private business or what if it's a city owned business you know and then Romans 13 and do we have a duty to you know obey the magistrate and what if the magistrate doesn't have the right to do it or maybe he does you know there were so many interlocking questions with the masks and you know so this is not a discussion of that like Simple test. Did you wear one? Coward. Did you not? Wait. It, it's not. It's not that. <laughs> I think we all spent plenty of time with the masks on, right? So this is not the discussion of that. But I do think that that topic was one that probably forced all of us to have to think about, like, you know, am I willing to? stand out? Like, am I willing to do something different? I think we all probably recognize that on that subject, our personal bravery or our personal lack thereof um, was sort of brought to the surface, right? Because you had to think about it, not just in terms of science and in terms of Romans 13 and in terms of loving your neighbor and all of that, but also in terms of just, am I tough enough to do this? You know, that sort of thing. And that's the piece I want to talk about. Not whether or not in every situation he should have put it on. But there, um, I think that it was very easy to be motivated by fear into doing something you didn't believe in. And it was the fear of what other people would think, right? Plenty of people wore the masks as they were really convinced that this is the best move. Like, this is just the right move. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you put it on and you you didn't believe in it at all and the only reason you did it was to not have a situation of some sort right so and again i'm not even saying that every time that's the wrong move but i'm just saying you can ask yourself how much does that register for me what am i willing to do and not do in order to not have somebody give me the stink eye um I think it was very easy to be motivated by fear. Some people probably genuinely motivated by love, but it was easy to be motivated by fear and then act like what you were motivated by was love. That's the thing that I really care about, right? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all know whether or not, you know, we were doing this at some point. So if you remember the sensations as you sat in the parking lot and decided whether you were going to put it on or whether you were not going to put it on, what was the math that was running in your head, right? Like, what, what were the factors that were coming into play? And there can be lots of really important other one strategy and, you know, is this a hill to die on right here, right now at the dollar store? Um, you know, it's not that. But I'm just saying how much does the fear of man factor in your ability to make decisions, Right? And, and then swaying your behavior one way or the other. Did you fear the crowd, basically? And crowds, the dynamics of crowds is, I mean, it's really a thing. It's, it's such a weird new dynamic when you put a bunch of people together. And I think a bunch of people all together can be a huge blessing or it can really be a curse. It's, you know, it's like guns or knives or medication, right? It's, it's a dangerous factor. Used the right way, tremendous blessing. Wrongly, hugely dangerous. And while they are a tremendous blessing, it's good to always be aware of the dangerous side of them. So what are the dangers of crowds? When you get you know, a bunch of people together, there are just some really weird dynamics that happen when you put people together in a group. There's this weird tendency to outsource your brain or your conscience to the, to the sort of brain of the group, which is odd. Ben, um, my husband, did a couple of like tours in England of, you know, just visiting historic sites and, and things. And he was like, you would not believe the idiotic things that people were do, will do when they're walking down the street in a group. Like when you come to an intersection, you look both ways and then you step into the street. He's like, you put people in a group, they'll just walk right in front of a bus and never even glance to see, and it's because you have just like outsourced all your decision making to the pack of people that you're just trundling down the road with. And, and it's true there, just in little details, but it's also just true of like your conscience. You can just outsource your conscience. Well, they're all doing it, you know, so I don't, I just am gonna waltz down the street, you know, in the group. Um, I think it's my grandpa was 
telling my kids a story about um, sheep. Like if you have a bunch of sheep and you put a broom, you hold like a broomstick and you throw the first one over it, then they will all start hopping over it and then you can take the broom away and they just all keep doing it. And I think there's a lot of good reasons that the Bible calls us sheep all the time. <laughs> because we really do just kind of keep doing the thing. I don't know if you've seen that video from, I don't know, a few years ago where they just run this experiment in a waiting room where they beep and one person stands up and then sits down and then a little bit later it beeps and the person stands up and sits down and pretty soon the other people start doing it and then they start calling people out one at a time and new people are coming in and they all will just like look around and then they stand up when it beeps and it goes away to just one lone woman in the room by herself and it beeps and she stands up. You know, it's just very strange. Like people really can outsource their own conscience or their own brains to the sort of wisdom of the masses around them, um, which is obviously a dangerous thing. You end up believing things simply because the group around you believes those things. Um, you can also get power structures developing in a group based on super weird, you know, super weird dynamics. So you have um, some woman online that you believe on medical issues because she has a lot of followers on Instagram, you know, so clearly she knows what she's talking about. She has a blue check by her name too. Or, you know, you believe her on parenting because she has such a great sense of style. You know, it's like you can... <laughs> You can have very weird, you know, like people become a leader in the group for very odd reasons. Um, C.S. Lewis has a, again, this is on a different subject, but I think it illustrates the point. He says, keep clear of psychiatrists unless you know that they are also Christians. Otherwise, they start with the assumption that your religion is an illusion and try to cure it. And this assumption they make not as professional psychologists, but as amateur philosophers, which I think is really an interesting distinction, right? It's like, yeah, that's, that's actually not what you're good at here, but you are being an amateur philosopher in this case, and that is what can happen in a group. You have somebody who runs fast, so now we think he's an expert on politics or whatever, and they, they come to the top of the pack, and then now we just believe what they say. Just because she has a beautiful house doesn't make her an expert theologian, you know, et cetera. So we allow people to become authorities because they have gathered the sort of momentum of the crowd and they gathered it for a totally other reason. Um, the other thing, and I think this is the real danger for, especially, you know, if you're in a conservative church that's, you know, strong and everything, I think a real danger is you can start attributing the virtues of the group to yourself. And you can think that because I'm in a brave church, that makes me a brave person. And it, it does not, necessarily, because how well would you do if they didn't show up <laughs> and it was just you? Um, you have a, you know, a brave pastor, therefore you're a brave person yourself, which is not, not the case, necessarily. And I know, like during the whole mask kerfluffle that was going on here, um, I teach at Logos, and they just let you do whatever you wanted to do, and you didn't have to wear a mask, and if you wanted to, you could. So it was a perfectly safe place for me to go every day without a mask on, and I didn't even think about it. I just went through my life teaching, you know, didn't feel like I was being especially brave, because I wasn't, because I just was walking into a group of people who were all cool with it. But that's a very different sensation than sitting there outside a business where you just don't know what you're about to encounter, you know, and so that's the thing is you can think, oh, see, I'm in this very brave group of people. That makes me, you know, a brave person. It's not, not true, um, not necessarily true. So I tell my students at Logos, you know how you can get like a coat closet that's super packed tight and you have to like jam, you know, the hangers in? And then you could start taking hangers out and the coats won't fall down because they're just, they're just being held up there. That's really what it can be like, and you feel like you're great because you're, you know, you're up there, but do you have a hanger? You know, like if those coats <laughs> got pushed aside, would you just flop on the floor, or are you actually solid there? And there's a lot of kids, you know, that may grow up in a Christian school, and so, you know, they're doing the right thing, and then, but you pick them up out of school and you put them in a secular college somewhere, that's when you find out whether or not they had it internalized or whether they were just being held up by the 
you know, pressure of the group. I think um, many of us can be tempted if in a complicated situation where the people around you, you know, it's kind of a dicey thing. There's the temptation to like save your voice, you know, like I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm just going to wait till I get the promotion. Then I'm going to be able to, you know, use my influence. I'm just going to keep my head down until I get the degree. And then I'm going to be able to say what I really think. I'm going to be able to, I'm just going to keep my head down until, you know, I've made it through these hurdles. And then you will find out that by the time you have made it there, you have nothing to say. You've saved your voice to the point where you now have nothing to say anymore. So, you know, allowing those little excuses of, yes, I'm a very brave person, I just have to be strategic. And I'm so strategic that no one ever knows that I'm a brave person because I never do anything brave. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back to the image of, of buckling, you know, you buckle under the pressure of going against your conscience for fear of the crowd, it might be a literal fear of bodily harm right? It could be that kind of thing. It might be fear of financial harm. It might be the plain old fear of being shamed, of having people uh, laughing at you or people angry at you or shouting at you or just giving you the death stare and whispering. Um, if you let your behavior or your convictions be changed because you're recoiling away from that, then that's when I think we can say you have fallen into the fear of man. We often excuse little compromises because it's not a gospel issue, you know? Like, it's, I, it was not a big deal because it's, it's not a gospel issue. Um, but cowardice is cowardice is cowardice, right? It really is. And you will reveal in the small things what you will be like in the big things. He who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. And if you have tanked it on every single exercise leading up to the test, then when it comes to the the big test, why would we assume that you would suddenly, you know, perform at this amazing level? So we can't be huge compromisers on all the little stuff and then expect to be like majestically, triumphantly brave uh, when it comes down to the, to the big ones. You are exercising a muscle every time you face one of these issues. So when you react to the dynamics of the crowd, you are, you are exercising and strengthening a muscle and you're either exercising, exercising your chickening out muscle or you're exercising your bravery muscle. And so you're also teaching your children who are in your house watching how you cope with all of this. You're teaching them how to engage with peer pressure. I often think it's funny that parents want their children to not cave to peer pressure, you know. But <laughs> the parents themselves would never dream of, like, saying something to another parent about, you know, like, did you see this problem with your kid? You might want to address it. It's like, couldn't, could never do that. And yet they want their child to be able to just stand up to crowds of 10-year-olds somehow when you yourself aren't able to do it, right? Um, another thing is, are you crippling your husband? and making him unable to do the right thing or unable to be brave because you're a little, you know, mess at home begging him not to do it, right? Are you allowing your fear to <clears throat> dominate what he is able to say or do? And are you teaching your children to be um, chameleons, basically? So if we're going to combat this, if we're going to try to replace the fear of man with something else, we just go back to mom's talk. You have to replace the fear of man with the fear of God. That is the only way to combat this. You have to fear something far greater than these people, right? And so um, that's, that's the obvious solution to this, is you can't actually be afraid of man if you truly fear God in the right way. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> also recognize not every single hill is the hill to die on. And that is a really important thing. Sometimes you walk away from a fight because it is a stupid fight and it is not beneficial to anyone. And you really ought to walk away from the fight. And then other times you walk away from a fight because you're a coward. And usually what we tend to do if we're walking away from it because we're a coward, we act like we're, act, we're walking away from it for other reasons, you know, because you know the principle of the thing. Um, so that's where you just have to be really honest with yourself. What was your real reason for doing it? Was it really principled or was it because you were being a chicken? So um, 
But I do think it is very important to, to notice that not every single issue is a here I stand, I can do no other kind of an issue, right? You, you do have to recognize the big things from the little things. Um, but we have to replace the fear of man with the fear of God. Psalm 118, 6, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me, right? If you fear God, that is the safe place to be. What can man do to me? If you fear man and you let that dictate your actions, what can God do to me? You know, that's not, a <laughs> I shall do what man tells me to, because what can God do to me is, you see, when we looked at that Proverbs verse, that is not a safe place to stand, right? If you want safety, fear God first, and don't allow the other humans around you to determine your, your path. Um, it is the safe choice to fear God first. So <clears throat> the fear of God excludes the fear of man. You have to replace the one with the other. And so if you know that for the last long time I have been really, really dominated by the fear of man, then I would say that the first thing you ought to do is say, that's, that's what I need to work on. If you think of it as like a placement test, it's like I'm flunking every single test. What should I do? Where, where, where should I study? That's, I refer you back to mom's talk, fear of, fear of God. And she already talked about the Old Testament midwives, but I think it is such a phenomenal story. Like whenever we talk about the Hebrew midwives, I feel like we only bring that up to talk about whether or not it's ethical to lie in certain circumstances. You know, like that's the only thing that we seem to notice about that. But if you read the passage, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of which the name of the one was Shifra and the name of the other was Pua. And that's intense. It was two ladies with names. It's not like, oh, something came down from the CDC now that we're also, you know, an edict from the palace. I think that's how I always kind of tended to think of it. Sort of a hear ye, hear ye, you know, any midwives in the land. It's Shifra and Pua, and they are having a face-to-face -face conversation with Pharaoh. So that is high stakes right there. I mean, that's a, that's a terrifying situation. And he tells them, you know, you have to kill all the baby boys, and then they don't. Like, they, they actually don't do it. And if you can imagine just directly disobeying the most powerful man in the world, who's also incredibly cruel, as witnessed by his you know, I'll just slaughter all the babies. It's not like you're gonna get like a citation for disobeying him, you know, or your pay docked or something. Like <laughs> this is a big deal. And I feel like this is such a great story because it's like Daniel and the lion's den or it's like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, but it's just these two ladies and we only bring them up to say, eh, I don't think they should have lied. Or yes, they should have lied. Um, but they were brave, like they were really brave. And it says in the passage twice, that they feared God, and it never mentions that they feared Pharaoh. So it because they feared the Lord, they disobeyed Pharaoh and didn't do what he said. And then, yes, at the end, they did sort of like, oh, yes, they, they're just fast, those Hebrews. Um, so, and then God rewards them, but I think it's just such an impressive story of they feared God and that allowed them to look Pharaoh dead in the eye and, and just not do what he said, which is really impressive levels of bravery. And it was because they feared the Lord. And because they feared the Lord, God rewarded them and gave them, you know, households of their own. So I think that this is actually the other interesting thing that I like about this is, you know, people still fight about who was the Pharaoh, you know, who was really the Pharaoh. And they have to get into Egyptian chronology and fight about that and whether the dark ages, and I think it was this one and other people think it was that one. And we don't know. I mean, he's the nameless pharaoh. You can think you might know which one. And it's very funny because the pharaohs were very into establishing an everlasting name for themselves, you know? Like, they were big on tributes to themselves. We don't even know his name, and we, but we do know theirs. We know that it was Shifra and Pua, which is really funny to me that it's like, Ramses? I don't know. We're not sure if it was him or not. So if you can imagine having to face down that level of terrifying situation. The fear of the Lord is what gets them through it and gets them rewarded for their bravery. So yes, talk about healthcare workers having a crisis back in ancient Egypt. Um, <clears throat> so 
I do think that this is um, one of those passages that I think if you stop and really look at it, it's a fantastic example. And it's right up there with the big champions. That, but we just forget about, you know, we never, I don't, you know, like, do you even remember that they had names? You know, it's like, you know Daniel, and you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but I think that they are right up there with it. So, to conclude, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Second Timothy 1. And so, notice what's contrasted here. Your fear, you know, we aren't to have a spirit of fear, but rather, what are we supposed to replace it with? Power, love, and a sound mind. And so that is also a really important thing to notice, the contrast, because it's not that we replace the spirit of fear with the spirit of squabbly internet fights. You know, it's, <laughs> that's, that's not what's being contrasted there. It's power, love, and a sound mind. And so maybe you're a super internet warrior and your most frequently used emoji is the eye rolling one, you know, you just put on everything and you're quick with a snarky retort or you're speedy on the, the reshare with a like, look what the idiot leftists are doing now. Um, <clears throat> and you think that you don't suffer from fear of man because everything you post gets all the trolls and then you go and be a troll also on all of their posts. Um, and that is not necessarily the, <laughs> the opposite of the spirit of fear. You might not be struggling with fear of man, but you are definitely struggling with being quarrelsome and cantankerous and a busybody in other people's affairs. So that's not necessarily a trade up. Um, <clears throat> also, you're just an unpleasant person. So there's that. So we should definitely not be looking to replace the spirit of fear with that kind of you know, I just go around poking everybody in the eye just because. Um, that's a different level of problem, and it's just swapping one kind of sin for a different kind of sin, which is it's just not a, like I said, not a trade-up. So we're supposed to not have the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I think that those are all just, it's, it's a positive thing, not a dwelling in all the negative things all of the time. So we need to be courageous and we need to be brave and we need to be kind and truthful and jolly. And honestly, I think a sense of humor is one of the best things that you can have to get you through some of this. It's not the foundation, obviously, but it's definitely a help when you can sort of zoom out from the situation a little bit and try and see that yeah, there's a lot of funny stuff going on right now. There's some terrifying stuff, but there's, there's also, it does have its funny side. <clears throat> the foundation is the fear of God, and you should be obeying him consistently in all of his commands. And if we do that, we can rest and know that we are in the safety of God's protection and not out in the very sketchy place, which is living in fear of what man might do to us. And I think that in a room full of women, who are probably, you know, it's not like I'm looking at all Congress women here, all the lawmakers assembled in one place, but I think that this is such a powerful group because if all of us in our own stations, at our own place, decided to just be brave and support our husbands in being brave and teach our children to be brave, that is a very powerful group that we are looking at. And I think this is a far more powerful group in many ways than all the Congress, you know, women and men and lawmakers and this and that and the other. Remember Pharaoh, we still don't remember which one he is, but we do remember Shifra and Pua. So we need to be like the holy women of old who are not afraid with any terror. Thanks. <laughs>